Hello, my name is Ruth Hall, and I will be presenting today uh, on the issue of privatization of customary land and women's land tenure security and livelihoods in Southern Africa. This presentation uh, is prepared together with my two colleagues, Pilani Zamchia and Rafilwe Jawala. Our presentation is about uh, the question of formalization and privatization of land tenure security and what's driving this in Southern Africa and what some of the responses have been and the politics and debates about these responses. We embarked on a project entitled Land and Water Rights in Southern Africa from 2016 in partnership with civil society organizations in Mozambique, uh, Zambia and South Africa. And where we what we found was really that while there are land-based investments by national and foreign multinational corporates, and these have exacerbated land tenure and security among rural people, especially women, we found that these are not the only important processes underway. In fact, there are a combination of less visible local practices at play at present that are reconfiguring land rights, land uses, and livelihoods in the region. And what we're arguing is that there are both state-driven processes to formalize customary land rights as a way to secure tenure, but there are also a variety of other factors uh, coming in. So we draw attention to the fact that uh, there have been a spectrum of reforms embarked on by governments. Typically, these allow the surveying of boundaries, the registration and documented documentation of rights, leasing and transfers, and even selling of customary land. What we argue is that alongside these state-driven measures, civil society organizations, international donor agencies, and others have capitalized on these new policies and introduced what we call flanking mechanisms, programs that also advocate for the registration of customary land rights. And these are often presented explicitly as a way to protect rural women and the vulnerable from the rise in demand for land. So by helping women and others to register their land rights, the argument is that these mechanisms can protect people with insecure tenure from the impact of rising demand on customary land. Also, these processes can make customary tenure more legible, especially to markets, and therefore create conditions that are more likely, in our view, to result in the loss of land. So we argue that these processes are making customary and informal kinds of land rights, which are key to preserving the commons, more legible and therefore controllable to the state, to investors, to other authorities. But crucially, they're making the commons transactable. And the potential contradiction here lies in the fact that by making land rights uh, and land more legible, many of the, the people in the communities where, where we're looking find themselves at risk of losing access to the commons through these kinds of transactions. So we draw on ideas around statecraft, legibility and modernity, the kinds of ideas that James C. Scott has put forward. And we think that these ideas are applicable to the challenges we see in Southern Africa. So the question that we're asking really in our ongoing program of work is how is formalization of customary land rights, which is partly a response to land grabbing, in turn affecting tenure insecurity or security? And what are the implications? So we know that from the 1990s through to 2017, there were about 47 African countries that embarked on land law reform processes. Uh, Liz Alden Wiley has summarized these and argued that out of the 47, in fact, 30 of them provide better security for customary land rights than before. But this assessment is very much taking the laws on paper and at face value. Whereas what we find is that there are contradictions firstly between these laws and other laws, particularly business investment laws. And secondly, that these laws are, are so poorly implemented um, and even counter implemented in, in practice uh, that it's much more important to look at what's actually going on on the ground. What we argue is that really what we see is that formalization widens local inequalities in, com in communities, particularly be between those who have the power and wherewithal to register, to make deals, um, and those without. So information and money makes a lot of difference in terms of who gets registered. Also, we argue it's important to look at formalization as a gendered process. Uh, Horman Chitonge from UCT, for instance, and others have shown how specifically in the case of Zambia, 
uh, formalization and registration processes benefit wealthier people, educated and urban women. So even among women, we need to look at questions of class and locality and power. So we think that field work is really important to understand these differences in how these processes play out. Further, what we argue is that privatization changes how land is administered, sometimes eroding the power of traditional authorities, but replacing them with other similarly unaccountable and patriarchal forms of governance and leadership. Often what we see is an emergence of some kind of hybrid between traditional elected and statutory institutions to, customer, to govern customary land, what Pauline Peters talks as, uh, describes as local big shots that challenge the authority of the traditional big men. Uh, we've found similar dynamics in parts of South Africa, Mozambique, and Zambia. Uh, so far from cheerleading formalization as a process that undermines patriarchal traditional power, we should be far more circumspect we argue that we look, need to look at new configurations of power at multiple levels that link local big men to national, political and business elites, and in turn to international capital. Reflecting back on this process of formalization and, and privatization that seems to be underway in the region, we argue that we need to look quite carefully at how changes in land use are pushing formalization and how in, in turn formalization is shaping changes in land use. There's a, an interrelationship between the two. So on the one hand, we see a growing commodification of land happening alongside concentration of holdings of land. Uh, particularly, uh, we've noted uh, the concentration and rise of medium scale farms. Uh, this is uh, noted in a presentation by my colleague Surya Kakizimane and myself in this conference, where we look at our work from Ghana, Kenya and Zambia, particularly the rise of urban civil servants and business elites in uh, driving this new pattern towards medium scale commercial farming, a process that itself has uh, effects of exclusion and enclosure on local systems. But alongside this concentration into medium scale farms, we see the miniaturization and fragmentation of land holdings, growing uh, settlement density. And also alongside that, often what we would call the urbanization of the rural, which in turn leads to, um, leads to um, uh, commodification and formalization as people start to build, invest more heavily in residential property. So we think there are a range of, of paradoxical but connected uh, processes, often with clear patterns of winners and losers. So overall, we feel that it, while the past decade or so has drawn a lot of attention to questions around land grabs, corporate lands, um, and, um, and the formalization and privatization of land from above through corporate and state-backed land leasing, we feel that it's important to counteract that by looking at ways in which the defense of customary land rights in turn is also pushing towards formalization and privatization and all of these being highly gendered processes. So there are implications for policy. Why is this so significant in our region? Well, we argue that perhaps what we're seeing is an irreversible process, what Admos Chimowu has called the neoliberalization of customary tenure. So those are the issues that we're 